Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining me. My name is Dave Heinrichs. I'm one of the pastors at Eagle Ridge Bible Fellowship. We're a church that meets in Coquitlam on Sunday mornings, but right now we're not able to because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But it's my pleasure to be able to bring to you this Easter message. You know, normally for me, Easter Sunday is so exciting and joyful. I wake up with just great anticipation. I jump out of bed. I head downstairs to the kitchen where I just blast worship music and I sing it out at the top of my lungs and I wake up the entire family. And then I forego a healthy breakfast and I stuff my face full of pasca. It's this Ukrainian Easter sweet bread, kind of like hot cross buns, but way better than that. And then we do an egg hunt before heading off to be with the church where we do more singing, triumphant songs about Christ's victory. And then usually in the evening, we'll get together with the extended family for dinner to celebrate and commemorate this best of holidays. But this Easter will be unlike any other I've ever experienced. There will be no singing with the church gathered together, no dinner with the extended family. And unlike past years where I wake up with a sense of, you know, jubilation, that feeling of triumph and victory, perhaps what I'll wake up with is a feeling that I've been feeling many mornings. What many of us have been feeling when we've been waking up these days, which is a lingering sense of fear, disbelief, and perhaps even a lack of hope. Interestingly, when we read the Gospels, we see that this is just what those original followers of Jesus felt on that very first Easter morning too. They didn't wake up with a feeling of victorious hope for the future. On that first Easter morning, they felt defeated, full of fear and void of hope. Yet in the midst of their troubles, something miraculous takes place. Jesus. He shows up, back from the grave, alive and well, in fact, better than ever, and He changes everything for them. And even as we may be feeling today like those original disciples did on that first Easter, hopeless, scared, doubting, I believe that in the same way that He did for them, Jesus wants to show up and change everything for us today. Because the resurrected Christ, He transforms troubles into triumphs. So we're going to be reading from the Gospel of John chapter 20 verses 11 to 31. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Now on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. 
But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So we pick things up early on that first Easter morning. Mary Magdalene, she is one of a group of female disciples who followed and supported Jesus's ministry. She goes to the tomb intent on anointing the body with spices. We know this from Luke chapter 24. But when she gets there, the stone that is meant to seal the tomb has been moved and the body is gone. For Mary, it appears that someone has has taken it or has stolen Jesus's body. And this just adds insult to injury. You see, Mary loved Jesus. Jesus had healed her, taught her, validated and cared for her like no one else had ever done before. You see, women in that society, especially women who had been possessed by evil spirits like Mary had, they were treated like second-class citizens or worse. But Jesus, he had given Mary a future. The angel asks her, why are you crying? And she responds, they have taken my Lord away. But not just taken his body. You see, when they took his life, they took Israel's hope and future. They took his followers' future and they took Mary's hope and future too. But then Jesus shows up and he changes everything. Mary, she doesn't recognize him at first. Perhaps he looks different because he's in his resurrection body. Or perhaps it's because she's so distraught or maybe because there's tears in her eyes that she mistakes him for the gardener. That is until he speaks her name. Mary. Mary. When Jesus speaks her name, not only does Mary recognize Jesus, but more importantly, in that moment, she is recognized by Jesus. You see, Mary, with her tears and grief, with what appears to be a lost hope and future, she is acknowledged by the resurrected Christ. And isn't that what we all want? For God to recognize what we are going through, to see our grief, that he sees our lack of hope for the future, for God to identify with us, and not just us as in the people of this world, but for him to identify intimately with each of us as individuals, for him to speak our name, for him to say to me, Dave. You see, the solution for Mary's trouble, it isn't a theology that states that God recognizes the plight of humans. Mary's troubles they are transformed only when she has a deeply personal encounter with the resurrected Christ. And so Mary's future is restored, her hope is renewed, and she runs to the disciples with this great news that she has seen the Lord. But what's more important than that is that her Lord sees her. And then the scene shifts. Later that evening, fear, it has gripped the disciples' hearts, no doubt because they believe that the same tragic fate of Jesus will soon be theirs, that the temple authorities were hunting them down and will arrest them too. The disciples, they're scared and they're locked inside order, in order to stay safe. Doesn't that sound familiar? Locked inside in order to stay safe. I think fear has gripped many of us too during these days. Maybe it's fear of losing our jobs, 
fear of losing our education for students or for parents of students, fear of losing our plans for the future, or maybe even fear of an unseen force that has the potential to bring death. But yet, just like he did for Mary, Jesus shows up for these fearful disciples and he changes everything. He appears in the room without using the door, mind you, and he greets them saying, peace be with you. In fact, throughout this passage, he greets them that way three different times, peace be with you. And every time he'll be saying the same word, shalom, which is a standard Jewish greeting that is still used today. But for Jesus, this isn't just a nice way for him to say hello. You see, the peace represented by shalom in the Bible isn't just a lack of conflict, like a ceasefire between enemies. It's not even just some sort of inner tranquility. Jesus' peace, it's whole and complete. It's life as God intended it, without conflict, without sin or even sickness. It's a world living in harmony with one another, living in harmony with creation, even in harmony with our inner selves, peace with who we are. And most importantly, it's peace between us and God. And Jesus, he can offer these scared disciples this opportunity to exchange their fear for his peace because his work on the cross not only inaugurates the kingdom of peace, it solidifies its everlasting reign. Colossians 1, 19 to 20 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So Jesus' greeting of peace, it isn't just wishful thinking. It's a blessing and a promise of what has begun and what is to come. He is the Prince of Peace who invites us to exchange our fear for His peace as we encounter Him. Philippians 4, 5-8, it tells us that the resurrected Christ transforms our troubles into triumphs, specifically fear into peace, when it says, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, when Jesus met his disciples in that locked room, it was his nearness, his personal presence that exchanged their fear for his peace, their anxiety for joy. And what's more, Jesus even brings them a gift. In verse 22, it says that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Breathed on them. It sounds strange to us, maybe even cringeworthy. But the word breathe or ruach in the scriptures, it's symbolic. It's used for breath or wind and also for the Spirit, the Spirit who is the divine force and influence of God. This breath, or this ruach, is the same one from way back in the creation story, from Genesis 2-7, where by breathing on this figure formed out of the dust, God gave the first human its life. It's the same breath that the prophet Ezekiel sees in a vision from God, raising up dry bones and wrapping them with flesh and bringing them back from the dead. This breath of God, this divine life-giving energy is the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of Christ who brings us to life, brings our dead dying souls back to life, and who also will raise us up to new life, just like it brought him out of the grave when our earthly bodies pass away. So yes, Jesus, breathe on us. Breathe on us your life-giving spirit into us. You see, the resurrected Christ, he transformed these disciples' troubles into triumphs when he exchanged their fear for his peace, when he breathed new life into them 
filling them with the Holy Spirit. But not everyone was there to experience that transformative encounter. Thomas was missing. The others, they told Thomas all about it. But he's a cynic. He's, he's skeptical. Can you blame him? I don't. Like, I think I would be like Thomas if I was in his position. And you see, it's not just doubt that plagues him. I'm sure it's also desire. He wants to see what they saw too. So do I, to be honest. Right now, more than anything, more than anything, I want to see Jesus. I want him to appear right now here with me in person because I think that that would make things a whole lot better. I don't think Thomas wants to disbelieve. I think he wants to believe that it's what they're saying is all true. But the thing is, with doubt, it's like a virus. It's infectious. And if it's not dealt with swiftly, just a little can contaminate the entire soul. And the other thing about Thomas's disbelief is that he, he chooses it. He says, I will not believe. And he even chooses the terms by which his disbelief must be overcome when he says, listen, I want proof. Unless I see the nail marks in the hands, unless I actually touch the wounds in the side, I will not believe. You see, doubt infected Thomas. And maybe it's infecting us as well. Perhaps during this time, you know, we are beginning to choose the terms of faith as well, thinking things like, well, if God were good, he would stop this pandemic. Or maybe we won't say it, but we think, listen, I'll believe when he gives us a cure. I think we're a lot more like Thomas than we would care to admit. That's because we're also hurting. We're afflicted by doubt and we really, really need Jesus to show up. And he does. He does. Just like he showed up for Mary and then for the disciples, Jesus, he shows up for Thomas, offering him what he asked for, the chance to touch the wounds. But Thomas doesn't. You see, he doesn't need to because the mere presence of the resurrected Christ, it transforms Thomas's doubt to faith. So it's another trouble into a triumph. And I think this leaves us, this, this encounter, wishing that we were Thomas, like with proof. But see, proof, it doesn't necessitate belief, faith, or trust. And I think we've seen that even in our days of late. You know, it was only a few weeks back where COVID-19, it was an epidemic on the news in far off places. But despite the evidence, Many doubted it would ever affect us here where we live. Proof doesn't necessitate belief, faith, or trust. See, after Jesus rose from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 6 that says that he appeared to more than 500 people. I'm sure that there were even a few in that number that despite actually seeing the resurrected Jesus, that as days went by, maybe self-doubt creeped in. Did we really see that? Maybe they began to excuse what they saw and they struggled to believe. Remember that Thomas chooses what he will believe when he says, I will not believe unless, unless I see the wounds, unless I touch them. Then Jesus, he tells him and us, that we actually have control not only over what we believe, but over our doubts. When he says in verse 27, stop doubting, believe. You see, faith is a choice. And in order to stop the plague of doubt in its tracks, we need to choose to believe. But it's not going to be proof that gets us there. In Hebrews 11, 1, it says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. 
It's confidence in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. So what we need more than anything else is an encounter with the resurrected Christ. Because it's this encounter with Jesus outside of the tomb that transforms Mary's despair and grief into hope. It's this intimate gathering with him in that locked room that exchanges the disciples' fear for peace. And it is this personal confrontation with the resurrected Christ that allows Thomas to swap his doubt for faith. And it's these encounters with Jesus. It's when we are in these encounters with Jesus ourselves that we hear him speak our name. Knowing that he sees us. He sees what we're going through. It's where he breathes on us his life-giving spirit. Thomas was blessed that Jesus appeared to him the way that he did, but Jesus alludes in verse 29 to the fact that once he ascends to heaven, others will believe, though they won't see him, and they will be, they will be blessed because of it. Others will believe, even though they won't see him with their own eyes, and they will be blessed. And friends, that's us. Not only can we have faith because we can encounter the resurrected Christ ourselves and have him transform our troubles into triumphs too. All throughout the Bible, there are verses like Psalm 145, 18 to 20. It says, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him he hears their cries and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him. In James 4, 8, it says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. So I want to invite you, wherever you are watching this, or wherever you are in your relationship with God, you know, I want to invite you to come near to him. He wants to meet with you. He he hears your cries and he wants to save you. If you have never done this before and you're wondering, how do we draw near to God? Well, we do it in several ways. And just a few of them are reading his word, the Bible. We do it through prayer, which is simply talking, talking to him and listening to him. And we do it through meeting together with other Christians, which is a little difficult in these times. But you can contact our church office and we would be glad to talk with you, especially about these things. The Apostle John, he writes in verse 31 that he wrote all of this down so that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the rescuer. And by believing that you could be rescued from sin and death and have peace with God and everlasting life. And friends, that is the greatest transformation of all. There's one last thing in this story. It's always piqued my interest. It's Jesus' resurrection body. It's a physical body. It's similar to ours in the fact that it can be touched and that he, he eats, and yet it's very different. He doesn't experience sickness or decay, and he can also appear in the middle of rooms without having to break down locked doors. But what gets me is that he still has the wounds. He still bears the mark of his torture, these reminders of death. Why are those still there? I think it's because these have also been transformed by the resurrection. These wounds are no longer reminders of death but are now symbols of his prevailing, his victory, overcoming fear and temptation to doubt, overcoming sin and death. They are Christ's trophies of his triumph. You know, I have this massive scar on my chest. It's a reminder from the time uh, when I had cancer. And when I see this scar, it reminds uh, my wife and I of God's faithfulness and his goodness and his healing in my life. But it also reminds us of the temptation we faced during that time to doubt, to give in to fear 
and even to become hopeless. Unfortunately, we didn't. We may not have been like pillars of strength during that time, but we held on to whatever straws of hope and faith we had. And Jesus, he met us in that time. And I don't know if this is true, but I kind of think that like Jesus, that scar may possibly be on my resurrection body as well when I come into God's kingdom. Maybe not. But if it is, I'm okay with that because like Christ's wounds, our wounds can become symbols of what we have overcome by God's power. They are trophies of troubles that have been transformed into triumphs because of the victory that we have gained through Christ's death and his resurrection. You see, these days that we are living in, many of us may be left wounded, scarred from them. But see, those scars don't have to be just reminders of how bad things can get or how frail we are. They can be symbols of Christ's triumphant victory over sin, death, and evil. And not only his triumph for the world, but for you. And so my prayer is that you would make time and space to meet with the resurrected Lord, to meet with Jesus. He will show up if you do, and he'll change everything. In closing benediction, I'd like to read for you Romans 15, 13, which says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Happy Easter. So thanks for joining us for the message. We also want to say thank you so much for your continued support of our church's ministries. You know, this pandemic is difficult in many ways, and for a lot of us, it's difficult financially. So we just want to let you know that we take uh, the good stewardship of our church's finances very seriously. And we want to let you know that this Tuesday, our elder and pastor team, along with our financial team, are getting together to talk and pray and plan about how we can best safeguard our finances as a church going forward. And so we just want to invite you to please be in prayer for us for that meeting on Tuesday evening. And if you want to give to the church ministries, we just want to say thank you for doing that. You know, it's easy to do that safely from home. Just want to invite you, you can go to the give section on our website where it outlines different ways that you can give. E-transfer is a very easy one. Uh, there's ways that you can also give through the app and the phone. And if you still want to just write a check and you want to go for a walk and drop it in the mail, uh, you can do that as well. You know. Those financial contributions, uh, they're not only our praise and our worship to God, showing that our trust is in Him, but they make the ministries of our church that are continuing to go on possible. And one of those is our student ministries that I get the, uh, I get the privilege of working with. You know, it's been a hard transition for us and lots of learning for me, but the last two weeks uh, with our students, we've gathered together online in one of those Zoom calls. We've played games, we've worshiped, uh, We've listened to a talk and we even meet in small groups where we discuss uh, what's going on in our lives and we pray for one another. And that's just one of the ways that our church continues to do ministry to make disciples who love Jesus going forward. And so that's how you support us. And I just want to say on behalf of myself and the rest of the staff, but particularly from student ministries, thank you so much. We love you and just hope that you're having a wonderful Easter weekend. God bless you. Take care.